Good morning. Welcome everyone. We're just going to have a, a couple of moments for everyone to get into the room. Let us know where you're dialing in from today if you want in the chat. We love to hear where people are joining us from and um, Audrey's located up in Brisbane. I'm down in Melbourne. So we've already got two different time zones today just in Australia. Okay. I can see we've got quite a few people coming in. So I might just start to kick off because I know that We've got a lot to get through today and I'm seeing Audrey's slides. So uh, I want to make sure she had plenty of time to share her insights with us. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for joining us from San Fran. Joanna from Cairns, thanks for joining. Great to see some people coming in. So um, I'd like to first begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and we acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. For those who haven't met me before, my name is Melia. I'm part of the community team here at Blackbird. And today I am joined by Audrey Melnick for Giants Weekly. So Audrey is the CEO of Funnel Ventures, where she works with startups and corporates alike to implement a product-led growth approach and increase their SaaS trial conversions without developer involvement. Audrey has recently set up an Australian company called Unlocking Growth to further support ANZ startups through her expertise. Audrey's experience is further informed by over a decade of consulting, coupled with 10 years of startup experience, including as the founder of her own business, Trackbot. So today, Audrey will be taking us through how to increase your SaaS trial, con trial conversions without developer involvement, and how you can empower non-technical team members to experiment and iterate for product-led growth. We're going to have about 10 minutes at the end of this session for questions, so share through any that you might have using our Zoom QA function. Let's get started. Over to you, Audrey. Thanks, Alia. Um, really, really happy to be here and talking about um, increasing your SAS trial conversions. Uh, tell you a bit about me. So I've, I've founded a bunch of startups across B2B and B2C, and I've got over 20 years experience. I think you've already like covered a lot of my experience, but um, yeah, I'm from Melbourne originally. I live in Brisbane now, and in between, I've lived in New York and Tel Aviv and San Francisco. Um, so we've some, we've some, lived in some pretty cool cities, um, happy to be home, especially right now. Um, so yeah, so as, as, as Malia mentioned, um, my new Australian entity is called Unlocking Growth, uh, partnered with, um, someone else who's recently returned back from the States, um, who is very, has very complimentary skills to me, Peter Ecladius. And, um, and we've set up this company called Unlocking Growth to help, um, Australian companies, but also um, companies abroad with um, growth advisory, product-led growth strategy and execution, um, customer journey optimization, which is you'll learn a bit, bit more about today. Um, my SAS trial rocket ship program is all about um, focusing on your SAS trial conversions. So that's a coaching program. I can tell you more about that. Um, and also I've created a, a software tool um, called Trackbot, which helps with that program and with your, your simulations. Additionally, I and I'm working with an Australian client right now on subscription billing. Um, so I do some consulting and advisory around that as well, which is often a very overlooked area of, um, of SaaS companies. Okay, so there's a process to increasing your conversions in a SaaS trial. And it's not a matter of finding that one big thing that will have a massive impact on your conversion rate. It's actually an iterative an incremental process where each change will potentially have a small improvement on your conversion rate. If you're familiar with product -led, the, the product-led growth approach, being able to experiment is key to getting your users to their outcome moment. We all start out with a hypothesis of what the journey will look like to get annually signed trial users to the point that they're willing to insert their payment details and subscribe to our SaaS. But a hypothesis is just that. You can spend all sorts of time on UX and customer interviews, but the real data comes when they start using your product. And at that point is where the work is just beginning. So you may already have your own experimentation process or framework. And this is one that I've devised that makes sense to me. So it has these key steps, track your customer journey in trial, establish baseline metrics and charts, identify friction points, 
hypothesize the reasons for friction, design an experiment, implement the experiment, view the test results of that experiment, choose the most successful version and rinse and repeat. But before we can forward, move forward with our experiments, we need to get real on where we're at and what might be holding us back from this experimentation nirvana. There's one role in a startup that is constantly a bottleneck for forward movement. And that's the role of a software developer. It's not because they're bad at their job, but because they have way too much to do. There's always a huge backlog of work to do for the developer. So any new task that comes up needs to be reviewed in light of this backlog and prioritized accordingly. That's step number six, the one that says implement the experiment is often the key bottleneck. So this made me realize an opportunity. How can we reduce the tasks that fall into the developer's domain? What are the types of tasks the developer is doing that perhaps should not really be in their purview? So let's get back to that in a bit. Back when I was designing and building software for corporates who had plenty of time and money to throw at this, we spent time identifying all the business rules <clears throat> that applied to the software we were building in advance of starting to code. And then we might even find ways to set those business rules up so they were editable by the business people, perhaps through a business rule management system or by setting up a configuration module to manage a set of values and rules so that the business could change these rules at will. Fast forward to today, in our efforts to move fast for our startups, we've reverted back to engulfing our business logic into code. And the irony is that in doing so, we're actually slowing down the velocity of our startup because once again, we're relying on the developer to make the, any changes to our business rules. So how can we put this business logic back in the hands of our business people so we can make changes to them using modern methods? The first two steps in the experiment process involve analytics. Many teams think more is better. So they track everything. Clicks, page views, everything. The problem is when people look at their analytics, they can't see the forest for the trees. They can't find the signal from the noise. In analytics, yes, we want to track a lot, but we want to do it with the right granularity and we want to capture the full customer journey, not just the parts of the, that the developer has dominion over. And we want the right information to be available at the right time in case we may want to segment on a specific attribute. At the other end of the spectrum, I'm often amazed when I work with clients at just how little they're tracking. They may have some broad strokes data like signups, but then it's a vacuum of information when it comes to what people are and are not doing in SS. And both of these scenarios can amount to the same problem, paralysis. Paralysis from too much data or paralysis from not enough data. And what's more, most companies don't activate that data that they have. They don't leverage the data to give them insights into their customers or to tailor a personalized action to move their customer along the journey. And nowadays with ever expanding technology landscape, the complexity of capturing this journey and knitting it together across devices, sessions and tools is non-trivial. Could an engineer handle it? Probably, but remember about them having too many other things to do. <laughs> So we all know the saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And yet what you're doing isn't working. If it were, you wouldn't be here. So we need to break our current patterns. Those three problems are some of the core issues that will amount to your experimentation process not being a success within the time frame you need it to be. And if you can't experiment or even implement the changes you think you will move the needle, then you'll stay in this insanity loop. So how can we break these patterns so that we can deploy our experimentation process? With customer journey optimization. It reduces the cost to acquire and retain a customer and increases lifetime value, but without developer involvement. The one underlying principle of customer journey optimization is empowering your non-technical team members to move fast and iterate without developer involvement. In so doing, your team members feel unencumbered when in experimenting and iterating on their funnel initiatives. And this is extremely powerful. So startup problem number one, the bottleneck is one issue that everyone I talk with from startups to corporates connects with. I've never met anyone that said to me that their developer is sitting around trying to find out, figure out what to work to do because they have nothing on their plate. 
how many times have you come up with an idea you want to implement and the second thought you have is that you don't have the developer resources to implement it? I'm guessing you've lost count because I know I have. And that's where the customer journey optimization methodology comes in. It removes business logic from code and puts it back in the hands of the people that make decisions about it. So they can make changes to it without writing code, without deploying a software release. All it requires is access to the right tools in the customer journey optimization toolkit. So this toolkit, this methodology comprises these five key components, the customer funnel, fit for purpose tools, the complete view of the customer, playbooks and principles. So let's start with the principles. Connect the fit for purpose tools together integrated by a customer data platform like Segment. So looking at this diagram, you can see you've got a user that's using your app. And what we wanna do is we wanna push user profile information and behavioral events of what they're doing in your app into a tool like Segment. And then Segment will publish that information out to all these other tools. Um, the only thing you need to build is this blue line. The rest of it will actually be done automatically. Um, so yeah, so number two is that all that customer data should be available to all those tools. Number three is that components should be replaceable. So let's say you wanna change out your help desk from Help Scout to Zendesk. You wanna be able to do that again without having to um, derail your developer backlog and get them to make that change because that will mean it's less likely to happen. So once again, we wanna be able to have this decoupling architecture. Business rules should be changeable by the business and not live in code. You've heard me say it already. Um, you wanna be able to experiment and iterate with guiding content, like work with um, onboarding playbooks and, um, and flows and uh, um, tool tips and those kinds of things in product messages. You wanna be able to, you're never gonna get that right from day one and you wanna be able to make changes to that again without having to go back to the developer to make that change. Number six, don't distract the developer. The developer should be focused on building the core product, not on things that convert the customer. And we wanna be able to have experimentation with pricing plans, because that's gonna always make, um, evolve as your product evolves. And we wanna, again, wanna have more flexibility to do that without having to go back to the developer. Okay, so in order to get to the ultimate goal of hockey stick growth, we need to get to a point where we, can, where we can rapidly experiment and iterate on the customer journey. If you could do that right now, you'd do it, but you've got that pesky problem of the developer bottleneck. So what we need to do is extract all the information about the customer and have it located somewhere outside of the database and your software code base. That complete view of a customer needs to be held and updated into a tool that your non-technical team members, such as your product managers and marketers have dominion over. We need to move business logic and content that the customer is exposed to from being embedded in code out to those other tools as well. Once we have that, changes to those things can be made without involving your key bottleneck, the developer. When you've managed to wrestle control of these things from the developer, your productivity will start to improve and your growth KPIs become disentangled from the developer backlog. So next up, we need to get our analytics sorted. If you don't measure it, you won't know what experiments are successful and which are failures. When your baseline is established, the results of your experimentations, your results of any experiments you create can then be measured against this baseline. So what do we mean by complete view of the customer? Every interaction we have with a customer, every interaction the systems we use have with the customer and all the relevant attributes of a customer make up this complete view of a customer. These interactions and attributes have a number of sources. Your application is one source. Another source is your marketing automation tools and they'll send email events like sent, opened and clicked. Your in-product activation tools will send you what onboarding flows the customer is presented and interacts with. And many more other tools will send various events. Our integration hub segment will enable this data to be sent to all the other tools that are receiving customer data and events. And each of those tools knows how to consume that information and bring that into their view of the customer or user. So our customer funnel is an eight stage funnel that applies to any SaaS business. And its power is that it provides a framework and a common vocabulary for discussing what needs to be done. Each of these stages has a goal and a set of tools and playbooks we can apply to them. 
The final piece in our puzzle is playbooks. So playbooks bring together all the other pieces in our customer journey toolkit together. The tools, the principles, the complete view of the customer and the customer funnel. A playbook maps out the interactions and events and how these pieces of information flow between tools and trigger various actions. So for the trial phase, we have these playbooks, trial sign up playbook, initial value playbook, trial extension and expiry playbook, activation playbook and the land and expand playbook. Most of these playbooks in ordinary circumstances in the way you probably do things currently are usually implemented using one technique, software development. But that was when you only had one tool in your toolbox. The customer journey optimization methodology is about giving you more tools in your toolbox, toolbox than what you have right now. The tool you currently have is your developer, but we need to reframe our thinking next time you want to implement something. Is code the best and only way to implement it? To move to a place where you can move faster to implement your initiatives, we need to use other tools so we don't have to wait on the developer backlog. So let's look at one example of a playbook that applies to the trial stage of the customer funnel, the trial sign up playbook. Most likely you've got a similar journey in your app and most likely it's implemented entirely in code. The purpose of this playbook is to get the user to verify their email address and to add them to an onboarding email drip campaign. When this is executed entirely by a software developer, it amounts to a verification email being sent through a tool like SendGrid. The user clicks on that email and there may be a single email is sent through SendGrid again to welcome them to your app. If your company is a bit more aware of what can be done with marketing automation tools, there might be some data sent to a tool like Intercom and from there you can own and manage the drip campaign. So in that case, you might be wondering how different this playbook really is to your current setup. So think about this scenario. If someone signs up to your app and never opens your verification email and they can't move forward in your app without verification, then you've just lost those users that don't open or click your email. And I can pretty much guarantee that your developer hasn't set things up so they send a second email if the first email isn't clicked. But with this playbook, by sending the user signed up track event through segment and into your marketing automation tool, you can add them to a multi email drip campaign that continues to send the verification email and variations on that email until they do actually click on the link and verify their email address. And you can test out different subject lines and email treatments if you choose as well. Also, because in this playbook, you're sending these two key track events to your analytics tool, you're able to understand just how many people are dropping off at that point by putting those events, the user signed up and email validated events into a funnel analysis chart. So that's what a playbook looks like. It looks relatively simple from a diagram perspective, but its power lies in the ability to glean the right information from what's happening in your app and to own the email communications that are going out and experiment and iterate on them. So a key trial concept I want to discuss is the concept of initial value. Think back to a time when you signed up for a new SaaS product. You had it in your mind, this preconception about what this tool would help you do, either from the marketing messages, the messages on the homepage, or possibly even from a colleague or friend. So when you sign up for this tool, you really want to have this preconception validated. Can it really do what it promises? And can it do it in an effortless manner? When you get to that point that you experience the value that relates to your preconceived notion, that's called initial value. So let's see how different companies define initial value. For Asana, it can mean creating a new project with tasks successfully assigned to a team member. For Zoom, it means signing up, organizing and holding the first video conference. For Expensify, it's creating the first expense report that is approved for payment. And for Amplitude, it's creating the first chart. Getting to initial value requires being on point with three key factors. When a user signs up to your product, they have curiosity. They must have enough curiosity to see them through the onboarding process to get to initial value. They come to your product with a preconception about the value they think your product provides based on the marketing messages they've seen. And they hopefully have a relevant problem that needs solving, one that your tool can help solve. You must get all three right to get to initial value and ultimately activation. If they have curiosity and preconception, but no problem to solve, they'll walk away from your tool thinking it's cool, but not needing to add their payment details. If they have a problem and a preconception, but their curiosity runs out before they get to initial value, there won't be a converting customer. If they have a problem and the requisite amount of curiosity, but your solution fails to match their preconception of what your product does, you'll lose their trust and their business. 
When you're crafting your onboarding process, you need to keep all of these factors in mind. It will help you craft the language you present to your user to keep them on track and to help them get to that point of initial value. So let's talk about what it takes to go from curiosity to initial value. Your new user needs to date before they get married. Your user isn't going to see the value of your product without going through some key steps first. What those key steps are will differ for each product. You most likely won't know right now what those steps comprise definitively, but you will have a hypothesis about what they are. And that set of steps to go from curiosity to initial value is called the initial value ladder. A value gap represents the chasm between perceived value and experience value. A value gap can happen for many reasons, but here are some big ones. The product fails to provide adequate value. The prospect is the wrong fit for the product. The prospect doesn't understand a product's capabilities or how to use it. The prospect experiences something jarring or painful, confusion, dissatisfaction, competitive incentive, etc., that changes their perception while using the product. So how do we bridge the value gap? One way is to make changes to the product, and that's usually a, wrong, a rather long life cycle. The other way is to use what we call bump events. Wes Bush, the author of the Product Led Growth book, came up with this concept of the bowling alley framework. To get the user from the current state to the desired outcome, we install bumper bars like we would in bumper bowling that pushes the prospect back on course. The two types of bumpers are conversational bumpers and product bumpers. So any event that's triggered from these bumpers is what I call a bump event. And the best part of these bump events is that you don't need to get a developer to implement them as long as you follow my framework. So um, let's look at TrackBot, which is a SaaS tool we've developed for pushing customer journey events into tools like Segment to illustrate what I'm talking about. These are the key events we've defined with the TrackBot product that will get the user to initial value. They sign up and update at least one event type that's been populated for them by default. They click on the start generating button, which performs validation on their configuration. And if all is okay, they can then trigger the generation to be initiated, which then starts generating events for them. We have some additional bump events. The checklist tutorial started, a nurturing email link has been clicked, an in-app modal or guide was displayed to bump the user to a key step like the generation initiated step. These are the bump events we've designed to push the prospect back on course to achieve initial value. The best thing about these bump events is that they can help with this goal of converting your customer during trial, but they don't require developer involvement. They use tools that can be managed by your non-technical resources. Some of the events that we define for our customer journey can be classified as signal events. These events are events that happen often and can give us signals into what's happening for the user. The three types of signal events are promising, concerning and activation signals. We use promising signals to identify the user's potential in reaching initial value. We use concerning signals to identify when the user may be struggling to reach initial value. And we use activation signals to identify user's potential in reaching activation, which is another stage. So going back to TrackBot, we can identify these types of events. When someone clicks on the generate button, it triggers the configuration validation performed event. And this can result in one, or two, one of two ways, a success or a validation failure. So we have a property on these, this event called validation successful and it's set to yes if validation passed and no if it didn't. So our concerning signal is when this event is performed and the validation successful property is no. This happens a whole lot of times within a short period of time. We probably wanna reach out and see if we can help them get over this hurdle. And it's probably a good signal for a product manager to focus on helping to improve the process because the user is clearly not getting the picture of what they need to do. I saw this happen with an early adopter of TrackBot and I updated the validation errors to identify which event types were an error so they understood what they needed to fix. The generation initiated event happens as a result of the previous step passing, so that is naturally a promising step. Someone who is really seeing the value with TrackBot is likely to have a few iterations of updating events and properties and initiating generation. So when you see this event happening a few times, this can be a promising signal towards activation. And finally, events generated um, that event happens each time TrackBot pushes out new events for the customers, test users. And so this can be a good way to determine activation. The key to note here is once again, this data is actually made available in tools that you don't have to rely on a developer to access. So you can implement these kinds of playbooks where you're prompting the user in different ways to convert them to a paying customer. 
So in summary, um, I've run through the experiment process. I've talked about the three problems holding you back, talked about the customer journey optimization components, the trial sign up playbook and initial value bump events and signal events. Uh, this content is part of a larger coaching program I have where we work together for 90 days to implement this approach. If you're interested in learning more about this program and getting access to my trial playbooks, then you can book a consultation with me at that um, web address and you can do the QR code which will get you there straight away. Um, if you're curious about TrackBot and how it can help you with your test simulation, you can check it out here at gettrackbot.com. And questions. Did I get there through it in time? I was like trying to get through everything. <laughs> <laughs> you sure did. There was a lot of information. Thank you for sharing that with us, Audrey. Um, and we do have a couple of questions that we will try and squeeze in in the next few minutes. Um, so the first question is, well, how do you get started in implementing this approach if you've got some of those tools um, and data, but not the complete customer picture? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you you've kind of got to go back to basics and look at like what it what it is you need to track and 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 what are the events that are really key going back to like you know those events that i just talked about like what are the what are the promising events what are the activation events what are the uh, concerning events and um just being able to kind of identify that i mean my whole program is all about that. So you can take my program or, um, but yeah, so there's, there's a lot of factors to it. And it's really about like, one, like I said, capturing those events, getting the right granularity, capturing the right properties on those events so that that information is then available in all of those tools. Thank you. Um, and what about like in terms of a small team, a uh, question from someone in an early stage startup, how do you manage this shift to this new framework? Um, and who should lead it in a small team with limited developer involvement? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's, 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 I always say like this sits at the intersection of product marketing, customer success and tech. And, um, and so because of that, it really will depend on the way your, your company set up and who is in, in there that has this, you know, this need to be solved and wants to solve it. Um, sometimes we work with product managers. Sometimes we work with um, the marketing team, marketing operations team. Um, obviously in a small startup, that's just gonna be, you know, one person that's probably doing a number of different roles. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, in a, and in a larger startup, we, we have our growth advisory um, services to basically like help maneuver the, the, the organization into this, this, this approach. Gotcha. Um, a question around dev time. So you zoom in in your approach on dev time as the bottleneck, um, but wondering if you've introduced or recommended any no code tools into the tech stack to allow more control and effectiveness for non-technical teams. Um, well, yeah, so the, the, the no code tools like, um, uh, app queues and user pilot, those are the in-product activation tools that, that I was referencing. Um, so absolutely. Um, and in fact, with TrackBot, um, I built it all with no-code tools. So even though I'm a developer at heart, I, my, my skills aren't quite current, so I kind of dabble. And so I built that with um, using Bubble and, and Integromat. Um, so, so I ended up like, building the, the onboarding flows inside of that instead of using one of those tools. So, yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um, as someone who's recently new to no code tools as well, I can definitely vouch for the benefit of um, not coming from a technical background in experimenting with a few of those. Um, actually, final question, a question on a tool um, segment. Um, it does require some skill to operate. Do you have any alternative recommendations uh, for teams who are looking to implement something similar but may not be open to using segment? Um, I'd want to understand what the, the resistance is there. It's not that complex. And, I mean, you're basically, um, you, you, you've got to move from, like, um, being really developer-focused to how, using some of these lesser, you know, less code tools. Um, but to do that, you do need to get some development involvement 
to, to get that information, that key information out. And that's what you do. That's what, how you use segment. Um, I, I don't know that you can really avoid that situation. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and thank you for that context. I think that's about all the time we have with Audrey. Thank you for sharing your advice and your journey with us. And um, I hope for our audience that you'll join us next week for our Giants Weekly Session with Alex McCaw, who's the co-founder and chairman of Clearbit, for a session on his founder to CEO transition and recommendations for, for others in that position. And remember, if you're an aspiring or early stage founder, you can apply to join our new Giants community to get one-on-one -on -one mentoring, connect with other founders and learn from exclusive resources. Sign up through our website. Thanks, Audrey, and see you next week. Bye. Bye.